Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Alessio Paches, and I'm welcoming you to this conference on investor sustainability engagement on behalf of the co-organizer, Professor Arne Lafare, uh, here next to me, and Professor Suren Gomsian, who is attending a very important family matter and cannot be here at this moment, will probably maybe join us later. It's a fantastic day today in Amsterdam for the pleasure of, of our speaker and attendees. Uh, but we also have 313 online registered attendees who are like us looking forward to discussing investor sustainability engagement from all sorts of law and finance angle today and tomorrow. Now, a few house rules. We use, we'll use the format five minutes presentation uh, in order to give plenty of time for Q&A for every speaker. Uh, we will have an online chat moderated by two of our valuable uh, colleagues from ACLE. If you want to speak from online, uh, well, put it in the chat. Uh, and if uh, you want to speak live, we'll, we'll probably find a way to make you, to invite you to, 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 uh, uh, to speak live as a panelist. For the on-site crowd, one crucially important thing, they can only hear us online if you speak into one microphone we have two well, we're three actually one for the and we'll make sure you get the microphone don't start speaking without the microphone because no one can hear it there the microphone doesn't speak to the speakers so for being heard here you will have to speak yes yeah, so may maybe i can show so yeah. now i'm speaking in a mic but you don't hear it here that's fine because they will hear it at home so that's that's yeah. a bit different. That's how I work. And one other thing for the on-site crowd, um, all your horses, why we try to accommodate also questions from online. Now, finally, bear with us. You probably know it. You've done it some, in, in your set, some other setting. Having an hybrid conference like this one is having two conferences in one. So we'll make a lot of mistakes. There'll be a lot of hiccups, but I hope that will be fun. Do you want to add anything? No, I think you were very complete. Just thank you all for being here, here in this room, being here at home as well, joining us online. And let's make this a really great two-day conference. So thank you. And maybe we can now give the floor to the first speakers. Yes, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to my colleague and friend, Giuseppe Dari, Professor Giuseppe Dari Mattiacci, who will be the chair for the first session. Uh, thank you. So welcome to this uh, first session. My uh, task is to uh, get out of the way as soon as possible uh, to give space to four very interesting presentations. Uh, the first panel is on regulation of uh, corporate purpose. And the first speaker is Colin Myers joining from Oxford uh, online. So I leave the floor to Colin. Oh, a few um, things. We have uh, 30 minutes per paper. So please speakers stay within the 50 minutes to give another 50 minutes for the presentation. I have two signs here for those who are in the room and uh, you'll get a message in the chat when you're short of time from Eduard. All right, Colin, the floor is yours. Okay, sorry. Uh... Okay, thank you very much indeed, Giuseppe. Um, and sorry that I uh, could not be physically with you today. There's been a great deal of discussion recently about the issues and problems associated with ESG around greenwashing and quite reasonably, a lot of concerns expressed about lack of correlation, consistency between different measures of ESG. And that's, that's come to the fore in relation to the recent litigation uh, that is arising in relation to uh, Deutsche Bank and, and its asset management subsidiary DWS and Goldman Sachs. Work that I've been doing with Bob Eccles amongst other people suggests that it's not just a problem in terms of the measurement of ESG, but there's an, also a serious 
issue about the interaction between shareholders and the boards of companies with the boards of companies uh, wanting their investors to engage with them in relation to their corporate purposes and institutional investors being highly skeptical about the extent to which corporate purpose is really driving the activities of business. What I, what I want to emphasize today, and this paper is based on an EC, what is available as an ECGI working paper on the governance of corporate purpose, is that the notion of purpose and the way in which it is embedded in organizations is at the heart of the issues that arise in terms of the concerns about ESG and the interaction between investors and companies. As you'll be aware, the Friedman Doctrine sets out the notion of there being only one social purpose of business to increase profits so long as companies stay within the rules of the game. Now, that's given rise to a substantial uh, body of uh, views on alternative ways of expressing the purpose of the company, uh, sometimes in terms of a notion of that it being about enlightened shareholder value, uh, focusing on the long term and the interests of other stakeholders, in terms of shareholder welfare, not wealth, or in terms of uh, notions of emphasizing the interests of other parties alongside shareholders. Now, those various different approaches are not in inherently inconsistent with the Freeman Doctrine insofar as they also emphasize the importance of profits. And indeed, that's also true of uh, a program of research that I've been associated with at the British Academy, which put forward the notion of the purpose of business as being about producing profitable solutions for the problems of people and planet, not profiting from producing problems for either. Now, this emphasizes that it's only profitable activities that are legitimate. So that in the process of solving problems, it's the companies that find ways of solving those in profitable ways that are really fulfilling their purposes. And uh, it should not therefore be regarded as a stakeholder, as against a shareholder theory in promoting stakeholder interests at the expense of shareholders. It's looking to find ways of aligning the interests between both parties. So there's a question as to whether or not the disputes that have ha been had between different models of the firm uh, and the notion of shareholder primacy is really just a storm in a teacup or a storm that's about to brew. Now, I'd like to suggest that there's some reason for believing that it is nevertheless still very fundamental, even though most of the theories uh, do still emphasize the importance of profit uh, because what lies at the heart of the issues is the notion of what is a profit. We know what in principle uh, the economic and accounting for profit is in terms of uh, revenue net of operating and capital costs. Um, but we also recognize that there's an, a significant body of accounting work that appreciates the notion of profit within a social context as a social construct. And there's actually some basis for that insofar as if one thinks about the origin of the term profit from the Latin proficarium profactus, it's about advancing and progressing. And what that suggests is it's not about progress that involves regress or is made at the expense of others. In other words, it's in relation to wealth creation, not wealth transfer. Now, the significance of that in terms of thinking about corporate purpose is that it relates to the notion of what the boundaries of the firm are. We typically define the boundaries of the firm in relation to the legal boundaries, the ownership of what the assets that the firm owns uh, and its contractual liabilities and claims on others. But what the notion of the uh, purpose of a company emphasizes is that the effective boundary lies beyond that of the legal boundary. It relates to what the company affects and the effects it has on others. In other words, about the outcomes to which it gives rise as well as the impacts. 
So that raises the notion as to, well, what is a legitimate profit? Clearly illegal activities are ruled out as are violations of regulation, uh, but so too, arguably, are uh, forms of not just material exposure to financial risks and deterioration due to non-financial reports, but companies profiting from producing detriments for others. And that requires appropriate account to be taken, the liabilities for failures to prevent uh, harms being imposed on others, which might otherwise give rise to unjustified enrichment. But it also relates to the notion of a failure to fulfill the stated purpose of the company and the extent to which it's giving due diligence to ensuring appropriate outcomes and opportunities. So that raises the notion of thinking of the boundaries of the firm beyond just its inputs and outputs to encompass its outcomes and its impacts. And indeed going even further in, th in terms of thinking about the extent to which the firm innovates and creates new opportunities for others and the extent to which that creates problem solving for others alongside its direct impacts. Now in thinking about this broader uh, boundary of the firm and its implications for what we mean by a profit. This is very closely related to the notion of what is the governance of a firm. We think of corporate governance in terms of agency problems aligning managerial interests with those of their shareholders. And that uh, focuses on the financial performance of firms. Now, as I've just defined the purpose of a business as producing profitable solutions, not profiting from producing problems, that still remains true in the context of what a purposeful business is, provided that the profits derive from producing solutions, not detriments. Now that's already being reflected, and I'll refer to this a bit later on, uh, in terms of uh, the way in which some corporate governance codes are emerging, in particular, a recent reform of corporate governance in the UK and an even more recent one in Denmark, has put the notion of corporate purpose at the heart of the duties of directors. The board should establish the company's purpose, values, and strategy, and satisfy itself that these and its culture are aligned. The board of directors should ensure that the necessary resources are in place for the company to meet its objective and measure performance against them. Now, that's quite a good statement as to what the governance of purpose involves in terms of aligning the purpose with the values and strategy and ensuring that the resources and the measurement systems are in place. And we've derived a system for uh, thinking about how boards of companies can effectively implement their purpose that uh, we sometimes describe as being the score framework in terms of bringing real clarity to what purposes, the, uh, what problems the company is seeking to solve through its purpose, to simplify its purpose in bringing that clarity to the nature of the purposes, to connect the uh, purpose with the strategy of the firm so that it's embedded in the core of its activities, to ensure that there's a real sense of ownership of the purpose, not just formal ownership by the shareholders, which is critically important, but ownership throughout the organization from the top to the bottom, which involves aligning the culture and values of, org of the organization with its, uh, with its purpose. And also ensuring not just that it's about culture and value, but also the reward system, the incentives and promotion being aligned to the purpose, which involves ensuring that the measurement systems are, are related to delivery of the company's purpose and bringing that to life through the narratives that the company tells and in particular, that leadership describes in terms of the way in which it's delivering on its purpose and also authenticity in being true to saying what the problems and failures are as well. So what I'm suggesting is that key to uh, bringing a real commitment to purpose um, is to think about how one relates the purpose to what is being measured. So, one can think about the purpose as being the why the company exists, which overpins its strategy and its mission, what it does, its vision as to where it aspires to go to, and the values that underpin 
that purpose. And that then has to relate to not just the measurement, the metrics of the inputs and the outputs, but also the outcomes, what changes as a consequence of the company's purpose and the impact that that has on others. And then a key component is, well, how do you then relate that to the performance, not just measured in uh, non-financial terms, but in financial terms as well? And there are two approaches that are taken to this, one of which is around seeking to provide values, non-financial values to, for example, human and social assets and natural assets. And the other that we really advocate more is around the notion of trying to think about how accounting in a conventional cost-based accounting sense can be aligned with that of the corporate purpose. And this is really where the issues arise in terms of ESG and purpose. Because what ESG is about is simply reporting. It's reporting uh, in a non-financial sense, giving uh, a non-financial overview as to what the company is doing in terms of the effects that it's having uh, on society and the natural world. But it is only reporting. And what it doesn't change is the underlying fundamental methods of accounting for the company's performance in a way that is then audited and verifiable. And that's where a number of initiatives have recently been in process. Uh, one which is being undertaken in the Harvard Business School in called the Impact Weighted Accounting uh, Framework, uh, which seeks to apply valuations to the externalities that companies create in terms of, of societal uh, and environmental effects. The approach that we've been taking in Oxford is to look at it in terms of how does one account for the costs in terms of uh, avoiding detriments, mitigating, remedying, uh, or compensating for them, rather than trying to put valuations on things that are uh, extremely difficult uh, to value and a subject to a high degree uh, of subjectivity rather than the objectivity which accountants seek to achieve. And just to give an illustration of that, uh, what it means is one is looking at the profit, not just in terms of uh, revenues minus costs, um, but also minus the costs of providing these offsetting effects to any negative impacts companies can have and also recognizing that what we currently account for as being operating costs in the context of a purpose of solving problems is actually often an investment. For example, the extent to which companies uh, train and educate their employees uh, is potentially a uh, long-term benefit to the company in terms of delivering on its purpose and should thereby re be recognized as having an element of being a capital rather than a current cost. I just want to very quickly end by illustrating this in relation to one particular sector, and that is uh, the financial sector. Uh, and, in a, and, and a particular bank, uh, uh, which has been one of the fastest growing banks in Britain, um, but is actually not a British bank at all, but is a Swedish bank called Handelsbank. Now, the interest of it in, 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 in looking at this particular example is that the bank not only has a, a very clear purpose as to what it's there to do, but it also establishes the values and the culture that are associated with it. And as a consequence, is able to delegate decision taking down in the firm to those who are operating at the individual branches. And what that allows the bank to do then is to build up relations of trust with its customers in a way that allows it then to solve problems of its customers through what is basically long-term relationship banking of a very local form in what is a large multinational bank. And so it sets as its purpose to have satisfied customers, but also to deliver uh, very good returns for its shareholders be, by being one of the lowest cost providers. And you can see that it is and has succeeded in being a bank that has an exceptionally high level 
of satisfied uh, individual and corporate customers and an exceptionally high level of consistently re high returns for its shareholders. And it's been extremely resilient during the Swedish banking crisis and the, uh, the financial crisis of 2008 and 9. Uh, and it's been able to do this through the notion of having a clarity about its purpose and then ensuring that the governance of the organization is aligned with that in terms of devolving control down the bank, ensuring that there's uh, an alignment of the values and the culture by instilling this notion of what the purpose is and the values in people in the organization, not relying on financial incentives. Indeed, it's a bank that pays its employees no bonuses until they retire at the age of 60. It's a very long-term investment. Uh, incentive scheme. And as a consequence, the people in the branches can take decisions, can build up relationships in a way in which in a traditional hierarchical bank, it's extremely difficult, if not possible for them to do. And that's what gives rise to the feature of it being a long-term uh, relationship uh, based, essentially local bank. Does this need a change in law? Well, there are already a lot of initiatives in, on law side that are being taken in relation to benefit corporations, uh, enterprise missions in France, etc. There's also the changes in corporate governance codes that are taking place, the, the regulatory changes that are happening at the EU level in relation to the EU taxonomy, the corporate sustainability reporting directive, the corporate sustainability due diligence directive, etc. And there's a lot happening at the international level in terms of standard setting. But the point I want to emphasize is the notion of what really gets to the heart of addressing the problem that we've seen emerging recently in relation to ESG is still to hold directors accountable to shareholders in the sense that they are the people who should be doing the appointing uh, and they should be doing uh, the evaluation of the financial performance of the of the firm and instead recognize that what is needed is to bring the notion of what a profit is and a return to shareholders in line with what is also a social and environmental benefit, not detriment. And to do that, that involves broadening the responsibility of the board to other parties over long time periods, but still with the notion that profit at the end of the day is a key determinant. So what I've argued is it's not a matter of the significance of profits, but what are profits uh, and that they should reflect the significance of the impact that, that a company has on other parties, on human, social and natural assets outside as well as within the legal boundaries of the firm, that the purpose should be about not profiting from producing, from, should be about profiting from producing solutions, not problems. And therefore, that the profit is derivative of solving, not producing problems. We should align measurement with that and ensure that the governance of the company binds the board to the parties that are involved in delivering on the purpose and its strategy and aligning the cultures, values, measurement and incentives with their delivery. Thank you. Thank you, Colin, for uh, um, thank you for kicking off the conference so powerfully. Uh, let me see. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be managing the Q&A. Those who are at home can use the Q&A function of uh, Zoom and in the room we'll do old fashioned with the hands. Uh, but let me abuse my position as it is usually done by asking the first question. So I was um, you know, intrigued by the fact that you stress detriments uh, because we know that most economic activities create harms and benefits and the trick is really to balance them. And usually we leave this balancing to the managers. You know, we have business judgment rules and other uh, uh, tricks in the law to not to have to make these uh, balancing decisions. Mm. Um, so, it, it, you know, on the one hand, it seems like your approach uh, tends to micro, micromanage the decisions of, uh, of management to an extent that the legal system is not, in, in, uh, is not um, uh, equipped to do. And, and if not, what is the difference between managing corporate purpose and using other areas of the law that all have been there for centuries to deal with deterrence? You know, why don't we use tort law 
to prevent firms to, from polluting? Why do we need to, to have corporate purpose? So I would really like to hear what is the boundary between the laws we have and managing corporate purpose directly. Okay, a great question. Thank you very much indeed for it. Uh, and the answer is that this is certainly not about micromanagement. It's exactly the opposite. It is conferring as much authority on the company to avoid the law or regulation getting involved in the management of companies. And it is saying, you're absolutely right, it is for the, the management to determine what are the detriments and the benefits uh, and to identify those with one proviso. And that is at the end of the day, the extent to which companies are causing detriments should be the responsibility of management to clean up. Uh, in other words, uh, it should be the fundamental purpose of the business uh, that management has as its responsibility, including its fiduciary responsibility, to ensure that it is compensating, mitigating, remedying, whatever it takes uh, to overcome the detriments. Now, how does this relate to other forms of law? The answer is it's very closely related. The most obvious form of law that people uh, uh, impl implicitly or explicitly refer to is regulation, namely public law. Uh, and public law is clearly important in so far as it sets the boundaries of the firm in terms of uh, what is socially and publicly acceptable. But what I'm arguing is that is not sufficient. It's not sufficient, firstly, because we know full well that regulation is seriously limited in terms of what it uh, can do, partly because of the growing internationalization of firms, which go beyond the national uh, uh, boundaries of jurisdictions. Uh, secondly, because uh, there's been a a growing shift towards intangibles, which make traditional, for example, economic regulation increasingly difficult, but also because uh, there are failures of regulation of both a type one and a type two form, namely that regulation stops things that should be happening and it fails to prevent things that shouldn't be happening. And so that we should be looking to management to recognize its responsibilities and to account for uh, its the extent to which it's uh, delivering on that. Does that rule out uh, private law in the form of torts? Absolutely not. It's encouraging the notion that that responsibility may, if, if directors fail uh, to fulfill their fiduciary responsibility, result in just such litigation. Thank you. So I see a question in the Q&A. We can put it online. Yeah, we can put it up here. Yes. Okay. So you can read it there. Thank you. Oh, so sorry. there is a question from Min asking that if directors are only legally accountable to shareholders, how can we ensure these directors to consider stakeholders other than shareholders? What is the incentive? Okay. So that comes immediately from the observation that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between what is profitable and what is socially and environmentally beneficial, okay? The notion of the purpose as being to produce profitable solutions, not profiting from producing problems, means that shareholders profit where the company is creating uh, benefits for others. And so the oversight from shareholders remains appropriate so long as we have an and an appropriate notion as to what a financial return for shareholders is. And the way in which companies establish whether or not they really are uh, uh, profiting from producing solutions, not detriments, is to engage with other parties, to engage with stakeholders. You know, that's exactly what I was talking about in relation to Handelsbank. They know whether or not they've got satisfied customers, whether or not they are uh, really delivering on what their customer needs are because of the nature of the governance of the company. That sort of engagement then becomes uh, more extensive in relation to what is required in, uh, in terms of engaging with stakeholders uh, in other types of companies. Thank you. So we can open the floor for questions from the room. Alessio. Yeah, 
assume at some point that, that the shareholder shared the purpose. What, what if shareholder change identity or you know their mind? What is the legal mechanism to be in mind with what Oliver argued? Okay, so the purpose is established as being the uh, the the statement of what uh, the objective of the company is, and the, the 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 whole purpose behind this, and thinking about how law, law relates to it, is to give a a commitment to that purpose, in the sense that. Once the purpose is stated as part of the process of determining uh, what happens if, for example, there's a takeover or a hedge fund activist comes along uh, and wants to change the purpose of the company, what is the process by which that purpose can be uh, changed? And that will involve, uh, and, 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 and that will be part of the constitution of the company, that the determination of the purpose involves a process of consultation with the various parties that are affected by it. So, for example, if Handelsbanken wanted to shift its purpose, then uh, it would, in the process, have to engage, or, or, or so a new owner came along that wanted to change the purpose of Handelsbanken, it would have to engage with the stakeholders who are in, affected by that, as well as seeking the support of the shareholders uh, in achieving that outcome. So, so it is the notion that the purpose of the company is a commitment. That commitment then should reflect the fact that changes to uh, what is being committed to has to involve those who are affected by the change in that commitment. Colin, yes. hi, Jennifer Hill here. Great to see you. Um, Colin, just two questions. I was intrigued when you were talking about the need for broader boundaries of the firm. Um, now, I assume that you weren't talking about broader legal boundaries, um, but I wonder what is the difference between what you are talking about, this idea of broader boundaries of the firm, as opposed to, for example, saying, well, the Friedman Doctrine was very much about viewing the corporation as a private actor divorced from you know, society. Whereas what we're now looking at is a different conception of the corporation as a social actor that must, you know, must interact with society. So that's that's my first question. What's the difference between talking about broader boundaries and talking about the corporation as a social actor? Um, the second matter it just involves, again, I was very interested when you said, look, part of the whole purpose of this is to, you know, prevent the need for law, prevent the need for regulation. And yet it seems to me that a critical aspect of corporate purpose or, or corporate culture is how you control organisational hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And I don't see how you control organisational hypocrisy and, and get accountability without really bringing in law and regulation. So just those two questions, thanks. Okay, and thank you, those are great questions. Um, so on the first one, in terms of law, let me just illustrate it in relation to uh, one particular law, uh, namely the UK Companies Act. Um, because in essence, the UK Companies Act uh, is, uh, an illustration of shareholder primacy. It talks about the uh, uh, the directors of the company must promote the must act in a way that is most likely to promote the success of the company for the benefit of its members. That's to say, its shareholders. Um, but it then goes on and it talks about and in so doing, take account of the likely consequences of any decisions on the long term, and the impact on other stakeholders. Now, uh, and, and, and then it lists a whole series of stakeholders like employees and suppliers and customers, etc. Now, there are two ways in which you can interpret that second part. The, sec the first way is, well, all that that is simply doing is that it's saying that the company, um, when it tries to maximize returns for shareholders, and maximize the interests of its 
the members of the organization should in the process take a due account of the long term and the interests of uh, other stakeholders in delivering on uh, those profits for its shareholders. And you know, that, that, that's one way in which one uh, can simply see this as being a, still a shareholder primacy uh, notion, even though it's sometimes described as enlightened shareholder primacy. Um, but there's, there's another interpretation of this, and that is to say, when it, when it refers to and have due regard for the long term and the impact on other stakeholders, that that is a requirement to on the directors in terms of delivering a benefit for their shareholders. That is to say that the benefit, the profit, has to reflect the interests of those other stakeholders and future generations. And in other words, that the company must uh, correct uh, for those in terms of uh, offsetting any detriments that it's having on other parties or on future generations. So it doesn't actually even take a change in the law to really bring about the notion of you know, what I'm talking about here as a corporate purpose being reflected in what the law is expecting of companies. Now that comes to your second question about, uh, well, Colin, surely, sorry, I, I need to ask you to be yeah, very- Yeah, okay, I, 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 I'll, I'll very quickly say, finish on this. The, 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 that the, the significance of law and regulation holding to account is twofold. First of all, that if the Companies Act were interpreted in this way, it would hold the, uh, the directors to account for delivering on the purpose. And secondly, that to the extent that regulation can be used as an effective tool, then of course it should be. And I'm not by any means suggesting that regulation hasn't got an important part to play. What I'm emphasizing is don't rely on it. It's not enough. It doesn't provide sufficient assurance. Thank you very much. Thank you all for the questions. We'll move to the next session. The next, the, uh, next speaker is Kobe uh, Castile and is actually in the room. He's here. So I'm gonna physically leave the floor to you and just helping you out with this uh, the Zoom thing, share screen. Yes. Oops. Let's get this over the way. And you will be presenting. Okay, thank you very much. And you have a remote here. Okay. Oh, okay. So can you hear me? They can, you can hear me at home as well? Okay, great. So um, first I wanna thank the organizers for uh, inviting me and for putting together such a wonderful conference. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and this is a joint project with Lucien Bebchuk and Roberto Talarita from Harvard Law School. And the name of the project is Stakeholder Capitalism in the Time of COVID. Now in the recent year, there has been increasing support for stakeholder governance. And by stakeholder governance, I mean the view that corporate leaders should be encouraged, right? To uh, use their discretion to serve stakeholder and not just shareholder value maximization. You're all familiar with what's going on in this space, the business roundtable statement, uh, uh, the Davos Manifesto, Larry Fink's annual letters. And an important building block in the stakeholderist view is that we have to rely on the judgment of corporate leaders. So we're going to isolate corporate leaders from shareholder intervention, and then they will be able to take care of stakeholders. Uh, my co-authors uh, expressed a criticism uh, to this view in the well-known paper. Uh, they're basically saying that the incentives are not there, that corporate leaders do not have incentives to use their discretion to benefit stakeholders beyond what will maximize shareholder value because their compensation is tied to shareholder value, because uh, they depend on shareholders for being reelected and so forth. Uh, but at the end of the day, at the core of this dispute, there is an empirical question. Can corporate leaders be expected uh, to use their discretion to protect stakeholder interest? And in this project that I'm gonna show you shortly, we are going to examine this question 
using the important context of corporate acquisitions. But before I move forward, it's important to put on the table two alternative versions of stakeholderism that are particularly relevant to the context that we are looking at corporate acquisition. So one version is the pluralistic purpose-based stakeholderism and major advocate of this version is Professor Colin Meyer. We've just heard this interesting talk about corporate purpose. And here the idea is that corporations should give independent weight to stakeholder interest because doing so is an important element of the corporate purpose. And under this view, when a corporation is being acquired, the pie should be distributed to benefit all stakeholders because we want to advance the corporate purpose. The other, the other view is based on implicit promises and team production theory. And here is the idea that the success of the, success of the corporation is a product of a team effort and depends on the ex-ante cooperation and ex-ante willingness of stakeholders like employee to invest in the company. And therefore, if we want to announce the prospect of ex post beneficial st sale, stakeholders need to know in advance that they will be treated well in the event of an acquisition. And based on this reasoning, prom prominent scholars, including Schleifer and Summers in their well-known piece, supported granting corporate leaders power over acquisition so that they can fulfill these implicit promises to treat stakeholders well. Okay, so do corporate leaders pay attention to stakeholder interest in the context of acquisitions? We uh, started to examine this question in an early study, and we documented that the answer is no. Now, uh, some people express reservation that our sample was limited because we focus on sale to private equity, and those are private equity buyers, and those are the most notorious buyers that are likely to lay off employees. Um, we looked only at non-Delaware targets incorporated in states with constituency status. And again, most of the public companies in the US are incorporated in Delaware. And we look at a 20 year period, while we know that most of the action when it comes to stakeholderism took place in recent years. And overall, uh, the size of uh, the transactions in that sample were somewhat limited. So in this current study, we want to revisit the subject. And this time we examine a setting that we think is particularly fitting for studying the question. This is the deals in the time of COVID. So uh, uh, we know that you know, the COVID, the pandemic erupted just after the business roundtable statement, just after the Davis Manifesto and all these important changes took place. We know that in COVID, employees were particularly vulnerable. Um, while shareholders were doing relatively well, until recently at least. And we know that the time of COVID was accompanied by statements by corporate leaders that they are rising to the challenge and they are looking after their stakeholders. So there is a question, did they actually look after stakeholders during this period? So to examine it, we uh, uh, constructed our data set. We look at acquisition of publicly traded firms with uh, 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 more than 1 billion dollar each, so the most important transaction. Uh, we had the sample uh, of the first 18 months uh, after the beginning of the pandemic. Actually, we're now working on elaborating this sample, so we have a two-year period. Uh, our final sample included 116 transactions with aggregate amount exceeding 700 billion. So those are really uh, uh, important transactions. Our uh, sample is pretty diverse. We have acquisition both by strategic buyers and private equity buyers. We have Delaware and non-Delaware companies and companies from all major economy sector. We and collected a lot of information uh, uh, from proxy statements, from SEC filing, from media publication, and started to analyze it. We wanted to see two things basically in the data. A, whether there was some sort of bargaining, and B, what type of protections corporate leaders were able to secure during those uh, uh, deals. And uh, it's also important to mention, we have a few mega deals in our uh, 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 sample, deals that exceeded $10 billion. So we also looked at those deals uh, separately when we analyzed the data. So the first thing we do is to look at the negotiation process. And we analyzed five dimensions that reflect the intents of the negotiation. We looked at the length of uh, the sale process, discussion with other buyers, 
offer by multiple buyers, multiple offer by the same buyer, whether it increased the deal price. And as you can see in the table, the negotiations were pretty uh, robust in those situations. Another indication to that is the deal protection devices. In large, in the overwhelming majority of our sample, uh, the buyers receive deal protections uh, provision. And it means that target leaders could get something in exchange for providing the buyer with those protections. Um, so generally speaking, uh, it looks like corporate leaders engage in significant negotiations in those deals. But the question is, for whom did these corporate leaders bargain? So we look at the different group, we start by stakeholders, and as you can imagine, but so we start with shareholders, and as you can imagine, shareholders receive significant premium from this transaction. On average, the, the premium was 34%, uh, and it reflects significant monetary gains, as you can see here, 1.4 billion on average. Um, executives, you won't be surprised, were able to negotiate also for significant benefits for themselves. A, by, being share, by owning shares in the companies, uh, they were entitled to the premium that I just mentioned. They also received special bonuses, closing bonuses, golden parachutes, and other bonuses uh, associated with closing the deal. And they were able also to secure some sort, I mean, in, 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 in the majority of the deals, they were able to secure some sort of uh, commitments to retain them, post-transaction, sometimes firm, sometimes software commitment. So overall, they were able to extract significant benefits to themselves, not only through owning significant shares in the company. So to summarize what we see so far, they bargain, corporate leaders bargain for and secure benefits for shareholders and for themselves. But what about stakeholders? So before I move to discuss stakeholders, there is an important point to put on the table. At the time of the signing, it was crystal, crystal clear to these executives that there will be risk to, to stakeholders, there will be risk to employees. How do we know that? Because we look at the media coverage and communication by the sold companies, uh, uh, communication to shareholders, communication to employees, and we analyze this. We actually look at all of those communications for each of the deal in our sample. Those are just examples as to how it looks like. But in uh, many of these deals, it, it is clear that corporate leader recognize that there will be some risk of cost reductions, which means that there will be some reduced payoff to some stakeholders. It's clear that there will be a risk of reduced employment. Sometimes they say it in a very direct and blunt way. Sometimes they say it in a nice way. We will embark on a thoughtful integration planning process, but it's clear what's going on there. And in many of these deals, there is also concern that the headquarters will have to be relocated and they also communicate it uh, to the stakeholders. So what's going on with employees? We find, when we look and we analyze the data in all of those 116 deals, it's clear that corporate leaders made little use of their bargaining power to negotiate protection for employees. In only 5% of the deal, uh, there are certain const constraints on post deal layoffs. Now you can say it's not surprising because buyer will not be willing to tie their hands uh, uh, before you know, closing and say, we are not going to lay off employees. They want to have those freedom, to have this freedom. But at least even if this is the case, we can think about a situation where corporate leaders could extract some compensation, some excess compensation for employees uh, to compensate them uh, for the uh, increased risk of being laid off. And we didn't find it in any of our deals. They didn't receive anything, even not the gold watch or iPad or something symbolic for the risk of being laid off. What we did find is some cosmetic protections. So there is a common provision uh, in those agreements that say that uh, employees uh, will receive, uh, uh, there will be uh, basically the same employment term will be returned for a transitional period, but it's limited in time, only to one year. And it's limited, most importantly, only to the employees that the buyer decides that he wants to keep employing in the company. Um, so uh, uh, in a small minority of the cases, we see that there are some small payment, bonus payment, bonus pools to employees. But again, it is a very limited economic significance. It equals to less than half percent of the premium capture 
by shareholders. We couldn't find in our data any protection for customers, suppliers, and creditors that are widely recognized as important stakeholder group. We couldn't find any protection, any meaningful protection for the environment. In a small minority of the deals, there are some protection in favor of local communities. But as you all know, the devil is in the details. Those commitments are generally not concrete. They are vague. They are uh, uh, easy to manipulate. And in any event, they are not enforceable because those are not uh, uh, third party beneficiary to the agreement. So they, have, don't, don't, they don't have an ability to enforce the agreement. Then, um, then we turn to examine a, a number of factors that may affect our decision. So I'll give you an example. Um, so one could argue that corporate leaders may have been unable to obtain any protection for stakeholders because the pandemic placed them in distressed circumstances that forced them to sell. They have no other possibility. They just need to sell. There was no room for negotiation here. So to test that, we look at companies that were clearly a subset of companies in our sample that were clearly not subject to economic distress. They, they were doing relatively fine during the pandemic. And consistent with our hypothesis, we find that stakeholder protection were generally lacking in each of uh, uh, those uh, uh, subset. And then uh, we have in the paper, I don't have time uh, to go over it, but we looked at another parameters that may affect uh, our results. And we create subset uh, that address each of the concern mentioned here. And I'm happy to go over it in the Q&A. And we couldn't find any different results in that regard. So what's going on here? In our view, the likely driver, what we see here, is incentives, right? And corporate leaders really don't have incentives to benefit stakeholders beyond what will serve a, 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 a shareholder interest. We think this result is clearly inconsistent with the belief of, the, of some scholars that corporate leaders can be expected to protect stakeholders in the event of acquisition, either uh, because doing so will promote the corporate purpose or to fulfill their implicit promises to treat well uh, uh, stakeholders. Then the last part of the paper, we turn to examine certain objections uh, to, uh, 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 to our study. Again, those are the objections. I don't have time to go over everything in detail because I see that I'm running out of time. So I'll just, I'll just show you one, one, one objection because uh, I think it's an important objection and then we'll take it from there. Um, so one could argue that there is a selection bias in our sample. So we are just looking at a, a stakeholder disregarding leaders, those who decide to sell their companies, being aware to the risks uh, going on. Uh, but those who care about stakeholders just don't sell the companies. But we don't think it's persuasive because there can be a whole host of situations where uh, uh, it will be beneficial, it will be efficient to sell the companies. And then stakeholder regarding corporate leaders could just divide the pie differently once they receive the uh, uh, transaction consideration and provide, allocate more, a larger fraction of the pie to stakeholders. So we can, we can actually uh, uh, find it. And the fact that we don't see it in our sample suggests uh, uh, that stakeholder capitalism failed to deliver during the time of COVID. Uh, we think that our findings are, are consistent with the view that corporate leaders have incentive not to serve interest of stakeholders beyond what would serve shareholder value. And the last sentence, we think that this finding caution against relying on claims made by supporter of stakeholder capitalism. Thank you very much. If I were a, a benevolent corporate leader, and I would know that uh, this kind of commitments are not enforceable, I will try to give benefits to stakeholders prior to the acquisition and ingrain them in some non-reversible way. And uh, I don't know, right? You know, giving 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 them the benefits ex ante rather than uh -huh. wait for the. Did you check for that? Yeah, I mean, we look for uh, we look at it, uh, the details of the transaction when the time you know the proxy statements and all of the uh, information that is brought to shareholder before, uh, uh, before we, they have to vote on the deal. And we didn't find there any uh, significant benefits that they receive. So you can think about, I mean, what you mentioned is you can think about the situation 
where they will instant find a way to make sure that it would be tough to lay off employees. Right. But you we didn't. The golden watch prior to. Right. We didn't find it. We didn't receive any any type of uh, of this. And 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 when they basically because they have to disclose everything to shareholders, they have to communicate it. They cannot just like that, you know, deliver this golden watch or iPad or special benefits. They have to disclose it to shareholders and say what's going on. Um, and we didn't find any disclosure like that that basically basically provide them the benefits ex ante. We didn't find any disclosure or anything like that. I mean, the bonuses that they receive are really cramps, right? They are very, very minimal compared to what executives get compared to what, you know, uh, uh, shareholders will spare, uh, get from the transaction. So we'll do so before more questions from the room. So we'll just, if you wanna take the questions from the room yourself? Um, yeah, I'm happy. I mean, could it, could it, could it, could I actually come in with a question? Is that permitted? Sure. Um, okay, uh, Gabby, thank, th thank you very much for that presentation. Um, just, just in re relation to what you were saying about my uh, work, let, let, let me just be clear, and I hope my presentation brought this up, that that is exactly not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not saying that one should promote stakeholder interests independently of those of shareholders, or that one should be distributing to other stakeholders at the expense of shareholders. That's precisely not what I think uh, is the way forward. And the answer, as I try to make clear is, how does one ensure an alignment of interests between shareholders and stakeholders more generally through thinking about what one actually means by a, a true profit uh, and not a profit that is earned at the expense of others. But, but also, I mean, the, the results that you find in your paper, I think, are extremely uh, interesting. Um, and, 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 and I cite them as being an illustration of exactly the problem that I'm talking about, uh, namely that as things currently stand, uh, there's no way in which uh, the boards of target firms can, can commit to anything other than, in essence, uh, creating the largest gain for shareholders and then potentially for themselves. And certainly they don't have the incentives uh, to do it. Indeed, you know, under UK law, for example, uh, it is basically the obligation of the board of directors of a target firm to secure the highest share price. Um, and so you know, what, what your results seem to me to show is precisely the nature of the problem as to what, what can be done to address uh, circumstances in which takeovers may well be not wealth creating or certainly not as wealth creating as the share price responses would suggest, once one takes account of the impacts on other stakeholders. Uh, so Colin, thank you very much uh, for this question. And first, let me apologize. If we mistake you, we'll make sure to correct it and, and get it absolutely right uh, in the next version of the paper. This is totally on us, so we'll do that. Um, and now, you know, we are interested in corporate acquisitions for a, one important reason, because this is a clear situation when we see the trade-off, right? I mean, it's, it's clear we have a pie here, consideration from the acquisition, and we have to divide it. And it's clear to see, I mean, it's not, it is not the more difficult situation when it, there is a win-win scenario. It's clear trade-off. So that's why we focus on corporate acquisition. Now to address your concern, we look at, I mean, this is actually relates to our previous study and a, a, a sub-sample in, in this study as well. So what we did, we look at corporate acquisitions of target companies that incorporated in state with constituency status. And what really uh, important about those uh, 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 status is that they allow uh, uh, corporate leaders when they consider an acquisition offer uh, to consider the interest of stakeholders and not to go along just with the highest share price, what is known as Revlon duty. Um, so even when we look at this specific type, and we have an entire study just looking at, at, this, at this type of transaction, when it's clear that you know, corporate leaders 
uh, uh, didn't have to go with the highest, with the bidder that provide the highest priced available, but they can also consider the, the impact on employees, on the environment, on the local community, what happened when we move uh, the, uh, uh, the factory from uh, uh, the, uh, or the headquarter from the company, what's impact on, even when they have the ability to do that, the legal ability to do that, uh, uh, we see that they were unable to extract any profits, any significant or meaningful protections. The results are substantially similar to what I've shown, even if the, in this specific uh, uh, situation. Now, even, I think that even in the regular scenario, there are some leverage uh, uh, and room for uh, corporate leaders and uh, 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 not exactly to go along with the best available offer, but we look at the very clear cases, the constituency start to experiment, and we didn't find anything meaningful there as well. Okay, but that's exactly the problem. And that is that the constituency statutes do not allow the board of directors to commit to a purpose. If you did it in the context of a public benefit corporation, that's different. Where there is a, a legal lock to a uh, purpose which requires something like uh, supermajority voting, um, or as I'm suggesting, that when uh, in essence what requires there to be some engagement with other parties in the event of changing the purpose, uh, that's very different. But that sort of commitment does not exist under the constituency statute. So Akomi, I would like to ask you not to reply. Okay. And, uh, we'll make sure that this is not seen as a sign of weakness on your side. No, <laughs> so Colin, I have uh, questions in the room. I would like yeah, to- Yeah, we would we'll love to continue this discussion. Yeah, so okay, all right. Let's give time, I guess, to Thank you. Thank you, Kobe, for your presentation. My question is actually very related to what Colin raised, and that is about the generalizability of your findings, because you draw some strong conclusions based off on acquisitions. I think acquisitions are a very unique type of event. It's when companies are in extreme, you know, oftentimes in financial distress, they have a high need to grow. Um, it's, it's when a company ceases to exist. Um, it's when the CEO's tenure ends. So I could imagine that the type of things that they focus on under these situations are very different and might not uh, reflect, you know, their focus on stakeholders per se that they have been pursuing prior to this process. Right. I, think in, I think of events where they face, you know, needs to downsize or downscope. These are milder events where you can see more this trade-off and space for stakeholders than with acquisitions. Right. So this is an excellent point. And actually, we address it in the paper as well. I didn't, we didn't have, time, uh, to, didn't have time to discuss it here in the presentation, but you are right on point. And uh, this is a criticism that we received when we started to present the paper. And, and people were basically saying something similar to what you said, that uh, we are looking at the final end period, right? And that our conclusion may be limited to the choices that are making exactly and that at that stage, and that we cannot extrapolate it to ongoing business decisions. That that was basically was the argument. Now here we we, we agree that it's it's important also to look at ongoing business decisions. It's tough to come up with the right you know empirical setting that is going to examine it because we are looking at those trade-offs and it's difficult to do it. But we think we have two things to say. Hey, you know this type of acquisition are really. Uh, important because this, they, those are large transactions that really, if we want to see any hope in stakeholderism, we should see it there because you know uh, they reflect an important distribution of of, of you know company proceeds between stakeholders, shareholders. Uh, um, so it's important. The fact that we don't see it there, it's already important by itself. Uh, then we also think that from a theoretical perspective, it's not clear that on ongoing business decisions, uh, corporate leaders are likely to be, to act more favorably to stakeholders than in the final end period. Why? Because in the ongoing business decision scenario, corporate leaders, right, they want, they, they, they face the need to, to win shareholder support in corporate election, and they would like to be reelected. Uh, so they will feel even more pressure uh, 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 to please shareholders, right? In our situation, uh, a, a, at least theoretically, uh, they don't have to think about the next election because there will be, be no next election. Uh, so they have more freedom uh, 
uh, to fulfill promises to stakeholders if, if they care about stakeholders. So thank you very much. This has been a great discussion. I'm sorry I need to close this uh, portion of the session. And apologies to those I saw with hands uh, raised. As you ran the hand up, I hope you can ask. Right. Questions. We will be delighted to get those questions and um, comments anyway. So yeah, please so I, email, I, I email invite email. everybody who has still other question to uh, get in touch with Kobe directly. Okay. Our next speaker is Amir Licht, who is joining from Israel. Um, hey, guys. Um, well, let me start with thanks uh, to Surin and especially uh, for Alessio for, for inviting me to this conference and making every effort uh, to have me on, on board and on site. I, um, I can't tell you how, how much I regret not being able to attend um, physically the, this conference. I was very much looking forward to it. Um, let me share. Right. Um, so this is joint work with, uh, with Renee Adams uh, that we've been um, busy uh, doing for quite some time. Uh, and it's called Shareholders and Stakeholders Around the World, the Role of Values, Culture and Law and Directors' Decisions. Um, and uh, well, thanks, Dan. Don't start with Friedman, as, as I think the lawyers among us know uh, all too well. Uh, it's, uh, you know, by one can, uh, count, uh, it's at least uh, 100 years. And this is uh, 1919. This is Henry Ford here uh, standing beside his Model T. Uh, and he was sued, as we all know, by the Dodge Brothers, minority shareholders in the Ford Motor Company. And he was testifying, he was standing in court saying the Ford Motor Company is organized to do as much good as we can. I mean, this is Colin Meyer speaking from Henry Ford's Fred. Everywhere for everybody concerned and incidentally to make money. So he's not a philanthropist. He's a purposeful money maker, uh, money making entrepreneur. The court would have none of that. Uh, the court answered famously by saying that a business corporation is organized and carried on primarily for the profit of, st of stockholders. The powers of the directors are to be employed for that end. Fast forward at least a century or about a century. This is uh, Leo Strine, possibly the most important judge in our, in our generation, corporate law judge in our generation. Uh, and writing extrajudicially uh, in a famous article describing the doctrine of, of Delaware, he says, directors must make stockholders welfare their so end. This is stand orthodox uh, Delaware doctrine. And that other interests, stakeholder interests, may be taken into consideration only as a means of promoting stockholder welfare. Okay, so this is, this is shareholder primacy at its purest form then and now in Delaware. But that's not only Delaware, right? Uh, this is uh, the, the famous provision that Colin has already alluded to, uh, the UK Companies Act, uh, Section 172. A director of a company must act, okay? This is, this is an injunction uh, for the benefit of the company's members. These are the shareholders as a whole. And in doing so, have regard, this is where things get hotter, uh, to all sorts of uh, stakeholders uh, on, on that list. Again, corporate leaders would have none of that, right? In the equally famous uh, statement from the Business Roundtable, uh, these guys say, well, we share a fundamental commitment to all of our stakeholders. They, they disregard Leo Strine, they disregard Delaware law. Many of them you know, lead companies that are incorporated in Delaware, but, but they, they, they don't seem to care. Uh, and closer to home, closer to your home at least, uh, the, the recent uh, corporate sustainability due diligence directive proposal from the uh, European Commission, uh, in the materials you can see that they say, the commission says, when directors act in the interests of the company, they must take into account the human rights, uh, climate, and environmental consequences of their decisions. They also blibber labber about the long term. So, these guys need to think according to the commission, according to some others, according to themselves, uh, from you know, the, the guys from the business roundtable. They need to think about 
the company in a very complex way, all uh, types of stakeholders. In this paper, we, what we try to do is to kind of try to, 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 to analyze or to examine how do these guys consider or have regard or take into account the interests of shareholders and, and stakeholders. So by way of a very quick background, um, I mean, at least to my taste, uh, uh, the, the corporate purpose or the objective of the corporation or shareholders versus stakeholders and so on, this is the core issue. This is the most important question in corporate governance and possibly in corporate law uh, as well. It is the subject of several massive literatures which, that I'm not going to survey. Uh, one line of work is, talks about the objective or more recently the purpose of the business corporation. Here what we find is a clear uh, a distinction between a monistic approach, which is invariably a shareholder wealth maximization. I mean, any monistic approach, th there's no other monistic approach other than shareholder focused versus a pluralistic approach that balances the interests or calls on managers to balance the interests of uh, several stakeholders. The, the distinction comes from, from Robert Clark and his name should, should be mentioned here. Another line of literature in the business management uh, um, academy uh, looks at managers' personal attributes. And there's a large body of work that documents the fact that personal attributes matter. So life experience make managers more or less shareholders, uh, being subject to ch childhood traumas, uh, being, you know, uh, uh, doing some military service makes managers always associated with managers being uh, more shareholder focused. Uh, classic uh, core personality traits, especially narcissism, uh, is associated with higher sh uh, shareholder focused management strategies. Um, Different risk attitudes, especially overconfidence, is associated with greater focus on shareholders. Political attitudes. This is this is this, this comes this comes close to what we do, uh, but in a very coarse way. Liberals, you know, you won't be surprised, tend to side or tend to support corporate social responsibility (CSR) as what ESG used to be called uh, uh, just a few years ago. Uh, whereas conservatives uh, tend to be mo focused more on, on shareholders. But overall, uh, the literature is in agreement that what goes in, the, in these guys' heads is a black box. Uh, and, and researchers have been do using only indirect proxies uh, for gauging uh, the, their personal attributes, uh, physical attributes, or uh, donations to political parties. This might work in the US, works less well in other countries. What we emphasize in this research and we try to kind of uh, uh, undertake is a two-level analysis. So in, in analyzing uh, corporate purpose or objectives and so on, uh, it, one needs to distinguish between the individual, or one may want to distinguish between the individual level of analysis. How do directors deal with this issue of shareholders versus stakeholders? and the institutional, social institutional uh, uh, level of analysis. How do societies address this issue? And here we, we use, we leverage the uh, framework that has been developed in new institutional economics. So we talk about social institutions. And again, we uh, uh, follow the distinction between formal institutions, these are legal rules, and informal institutions, these are social norms and culture. We, we hypothesize at, again, at two levels, um, and in, at the individual level, we actually have a follow-up uh, hypothesis, and we ask, is shareholderism universal? Um, here we, again, we, we follow up on a prior work with Lilach Sagib at uh, Hebrew U, uh, in which we look at shareholderism in, in Sweden. As it happens, we, we actually coined this term, shareholderism in, in stakeholders, at least we were the first to use it. Uh, we looked at board members and CEOs in Sweden, public companies in Sweden, and we observe that they actually exhibit a, a principled ideology-like stance. This is why the ism, it's a shareholder-ism and stakeholder-ism thing, it's a position on shareholders versus stakeholders. And, and this uh, stance, this, this motivated position, is associated with, uh, with their values, uh, especially with other regarding values. So I won't go into the details, but just use your intuition. It's 
a director is, is less likely to be shareholders if, a, if he or she endorses universalism, uh, but he's, he or she are more likely to be a shareholders if they are higher on values of power and achievement. And when you factor in another uh, value that's called self-direction, you get an entrepreneurial uh, value profile or entrepreneurial value type. These are people who seek power, who seek success, who uh, want to, to chart their own, their own way in their own uh, uh, approach. They're entrepreneurial. And these guys tend to uh, side with shareholders more than, than the others. The law notwithstanding. Now in Sweden, we have a single country, so there's a single law and you know, you may want to be surprised, but Sweden is very shareholderistic, nationally speaking. Swedish corporate law is very strongly uh, profit oriented. In this paper, we look around the world and we try to see, uh, to, 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 to examine if shareholderism is a phenomenon that's associated with personal values is a universal phenomenon. But because we have an international sample, uh, we can also look at societal or cultural uh, level of analysis and we can ask, does culture matter? And if so, in, in, in what way? Now, we, we know from prior literature that countries matter for corporate governance. Uh, in, doing, in, in doing the analysis more systematically, um, we leverage a theory and data set from Shalom Schwartz, previously from, from Hebrew U. My longtime co-author, this is the, the leading uh, cross-cultural uh, theory, and uh, we hypothesize that Given an individual director's uh, value profile, he or she may be more likely to side with shareholders or to focus on shareholder uh, value or welfare or whatnot, um, the lower his culture background is on egalitarianism. So countries differ in their culture on a dimension that's called egalitarianism. Again, think about it intuitively. Cultures that are more egalitarian, we argue, are more likely to, uh, to support one an individual director in siding with the stakeholders. So uh, a higher, a more strongly egalitarian cultural background, higher stakeholderism, uh, and there are two other uh, cultural dimensions. Um, we also look at law. We control for legal uh, factors. We, we construct the measure of a perceived national, national legal uh, shareholders. And some of you in the room may have helped us uh, constructing this, this measure. I'm grateful to all of you. Uh, we also use the, you know, the traditional, the conventional measures from the different data sets, some from LSV, some from the World Bank, shareholder protection rights. I mean, shareholder protection rights are a course proxy for how seriously uh, a country's law, or a country's legal system uh, uh, takes uh, shareholders, labor rights, and regulation as a proxy for entrepreneurship. We are not explicit about the mechanism. We don't quite know and we don't quite say much about the way in which national laws factor into the decision process of individual members. But we use these as, as control uh, measures uh, to have it in place. We have a sample of roughly, slightly below a thousand directors from, of public firms from all around the world. We use an email driven online survey that was done some 10 years ago in several languages. Uh, the sample is anything but representative, but we have large groups from various different uh, uh, countries and a lot of smaller samples and even tinier samples from uh, uh, directors coming from all sorts of culture, cultures such that we have enough variability to drive some, uh, some results. For gauging in directors' shareholderism, uh, we use a, a rendition of the, the, the instrument that we constructed uh, with Lach Sagiv. And this is, is this quasi-experimental approach, which essentially uh, uh, keys into the question that was just asked be, uh, in the previous session in, in Kobe's uh, presentation, because we use, uh, small scenarios, vignettes that are based on, on very famous like seminal uh, court cases. Some of them are end game uh, settings, but some of them are not. So these are like middle of the way, big decisions that directors had to take. In reality, they were dragged to court for their decisions. 
cultural in different ways, not in any uniform way on these. We present these scenarios, beef scenarios, you know, simplified and, and clean from any identifying details. And ask the, the, the respondents, how would you decide on this uh, or in this setting or on this uh, uh, problem? Mir, sorry to jump in. I'm really worried by the fact that you're at slide five of 13 and you have one minute. Okay. <laughs> sure. What do we observe? We observe that shareholders is universal and share, uh, directors behave, uh, the, the answer is if they consider, is if they try to do the right thing in line with their values, but, but they're not, they're not extremists. They, they, their, approach, their responses uh, distribute uh, quite normally. And here you can see uh, the distribution when we partial out the institutional factors. So this is here, this is just the individual residuals. So there's a lot going on uh, individually. And here uh, we partial out the individual uh, factors and there's a lot going on depending on social institutions. This is, we'll, we'll, we'll skip. What we see, I'm coming close to finishing, is that their shareholder directors from all around the world uh, exhibit a shareholderism position that is linked with their values exactly as we saw in Sweden. So the more entrepreneurial values that the director has, the more shareholders uh, he or she uh, are, are going to be. And in addition to that, we can see the effect of a director's cultural heritage. So if one comes from a more egalitarian culture, when, where he or she grew up, when he, was so, he or she was socialized, he, will, he or she will be more likely to be a stakeholder. So again, we'll skip this. And, and, and what would be the implications? Um, the implications are that directors come to the table on, on, on which they decide these big decisions, these big dilemmas, uh, not only in end game situations, with a lot of baggage, with a lot of human capital, their values and their cultural background. And this poses the questions, can we use the law to tell them what to do or how to think, or what does it mean if they commit to a purpose, uh, for instance, with regard to sustainability or whatnot? And, and, and we doubt, we doubt that we can use the law, that countries can use the law uh, to do that. We don't show it in the paper. What we do show is strong linkages to uh, values, personal values and cultural uh, background, cultural factors that do affect people's positions. And we observe virtually no role for, for legal uh, factors. What remains, what has already been mentioned, taxes, direct regulation, maybe regulating board composition, pack the board with stakeholders. I believe in that. There's much to do. Um, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Amir. That was an impressive. <laughs> we managed to get to the end without losing clarity. So I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, so I'm gonna open the floor for questions directly. And well, I don't see hands, so let me ask you the first question. Where? Oh, sorry, behind. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Right, I just um, wondered whether there was any evidence in, in your work of a selection effect at all, whereby a particularly sort of stakeholderist legal culture might affect the type of person who wants to become a director and through that route affect um, board behavior. Um, I, can't, I can't say. I can say, um, the, as I said, I mean, the, uh, the sample is, is not balanced and it could be biased in the sense that, you know, some, some type of, of, of uh, you know, directors may, might be more likely to observe, uh, I mean, to respond uh, to, the, uh, to the survey. Um, we find comfort in the fact that in the Swedish uh, survey, we had a very, very high response rate. Uh, well over a third, nearly a half of I mean, Swedish directors, I mean, Swedes in general, they love surveys, so they, they respond. Um, so in, in that sample, we, we are very confident that we don't have any, any bias. Uh, here, we cannot be confident in the same, to the same degree, but we observe the same correlations. So 
there's no good reason to think uh, that it is somehow biased. But again, uh, we control as much as we can according to you know literature convention, but but, but not more than that. So I have um, three sets of questions actually. So one is uh, the um, there are two two questions that you might ask people. You know, take the example of employees. You could ask, should the employees be protected? Like you imagine you're talking to a director, or should you protect employees? Right. So uh, the that that made me think that the relationship could could be non-linear in the sense that it might be easier to be a shell ordinarist in, in Sweden when you know the legal system is protected of employees being laid off in all sorts of ways that have nothing to do with corporate law. And I didn't see that as a control in your uh, law there. Also, I don't know if you know we run these tests uh, in the paper. Uh, but the point would be, you know, in countries that have a culture that is more egalitarian or that you would you know, in your analysis, you would associate with uh, stakeholderism. Uh, it would, might actually be ethically easier for directors to be shareholderists because they know somebody else or some other parts of the legal system are doing what they don't want to do, right? Or they, so they can, you know, they can uh, take care of uh, shareholders because the legal system is taking care of uh, stakeholders. That, that's a bit of fun. Uh, Giuseppe, Giuseppe, this is very, very important, and I'm afraid losing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Fred. So uh, let me share what I want, what I wanted to avoid, and it's this. Um, uh, look impressed. Uh, this is where your answer uh, lies, um, and we actually shared exactly the kind of concern that that you, uh, that you uh, voice. Namely, if I work, if I serve as a director in a country that has very high uh, protection, legal protection, uh, then I'm not very concerned about provide about the company providing protections uh, for employees because I know that the social the social system uh, will will take care. And this is where uh, the measure for employee protection comes in, and it comes in insignificant. So it doesn't seem to have an effect. Once again, I have to make a very strong reservation. We can't assume, I think nobody in the room can assume that all the directors know all the details and the intricacies of labor law and so on. But we believe that, you know, either they get legal advice about how much protection does the law give, or, you know, by experience, they have some sense about it. We, I, I share your, I mean, Renee and I share your concern. This is a major point, and this is as much as, it, as we, that we can do to address it. Next one. Yes. Uh, well, let me see if there are other questions on, in the in the room first. Alessio. Thanks. I mean, I think it's it's, it's very fascinating. I, I have I have a, this question. Um, Corporation evolve naturally, like, you know, they must be flexible, they evolve with time. Are the values of directors recognizable in some way that you can stabilize that if you were a shareholder? Can you say a few what I mean, what, what I mean is, if the law doesn't play a role, how can someone, be the shareholder or even a regulator, recognize the value of, of, of directors? Are these values observable? So that if you can, and in a way, by choosing the right directors, you commit the company to stay uh, pro-social, pro just yeah. putting the right directors in, in charge. This is fantastic. Yeah, this is, this is as, as I said very, very quickly, this is what I believe in. So if there's any hope, of uh, kind of trying to steer companies, company strategy uh, towards being more, you know, sustainability minded or uh, socially minded or the other way around, you know, shareholder value minded and so on. It would be through uh, composing a board in more in line with that direction, more in line with that with that purpose. Then the then comes the question that you are asking: How do we gauge? those guys' uh, inclinations, those guys, how do you measure their, their human capital? So, I mean, you can give them the battery that we gave them, you know, values and so on. Uh, you can ask them, what country did they grow up in uh, and make a guess, but that, that would be wrong because there's a, 
huge variation. Uh, it's called the ecological fallacy. Uh, and actually, a Dutch scholar uh, coined, coined this term, uh, Geert Hofstede uh, coined this term. But overall, if you could use some proxy, for instance, in Sweden uh, the, and in many other countries, in, in uh, member states in, in, the, uh, in Europe, there's an, a legal requirement to have at least some rep uh, labor representatives on the board. We observe that in, in the Swedish study, here we couldn't uh, do that. Um, we observe that those labor representatives are more stakeholders above and beyond their being labor representatives. So we control for their institutional role. And in addition, they, they tend to have a slightly different value profile that is associated with higher stakeholders. So if you pack the board, uh, with say, you know, people from NGOs or people from the public service or labor representatives or, you know, uh, former military uh, uh, people, then you could, we believe, you could steer or direct at least to some degree the strategy of companies away or towards, uh, you know, shareholderism and or stakeholders. That's, that's the key, yeah. Uh, there is time for one last short question. Amir, hello. Um, just a quick question. I was really interested in your initial, just, you know, when you set out Dodge and Ford Section 172 Business Roundtable and then the developments in the EC. Um, it seems to me that you know, some of those really expand direct, director discretion. I think that's the, the real concern of people like Talarita in relation to the business roundtable, that it basically gets rid of accountability. Um, whereas others at least potentially include accountability. Um, and, and that I think, you know, the corporate sustainability directive, um, where you say directors must take into account these matters. Um, now, then it depends on fiduciary duties and their enforcement across different jurisdictions. And I, I just wonder what your response to that distinction between using stakeholder, um, stakeholderism to expand discretion as opposed to using it to reduce managerial discretion or board discretion. Well, two quick responses. One of them is that what we see and what we observe, you, you saw this in, in, in the graphs, is that uh, directors around, around the world and also within the United States in the US sample, sample that, which is quite large, uh, we don't see the Bertru Castile Talarita kind of uh, directors who are you know, uh, 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 obsessed about maximizing uh, uh, shareholder value uh, during sales. Uh, they're all over the place. Many of them don't focus on, on shareholders. They actually side with stakeholders uh, in a systematic way, but, but you know, they're not extremists in any way. And that's true all around the world. Now, once you realize that, that you know, directors are human, they're not, most of them are not extremists, most, most of them are not sociopaths, but you know, they're, they're regular people who deal with, the, with an issue when it comes um, it's very difficult, and this is the second point and the first point that you mentioned, it's very difficult to harness fiduciary duties. Fiduciary duties, and this is, this is my, my kind of main line of work in recent years, fiduciary duties are, are very, very focused, are actually very sharp in focusing the fiduciary's attention to the best interests of the, um, of, of the beneficiary. Now, English law has sidestepped this uh, problem by focusing on the company as a whole, right? Uh, and into this whole of the company, directors can throw in whatever they want. And English courts have been very clear on that for well over 100 years, nearly 150 years by now. Uh, so I think the whole notion of fiduciary duties is, is a little bit of a misfit. In, in the kind of problem that we address uh, in this topic and in, in this conference. 
Yes, uh, there's there, there could be very strong, very strict fiduciary duties in the in the sense of not taking bribes, uh, you know, doing whatever you do uh, in good faith, focusing on what you perceive as the best interest of the company, uh, not looking inside this interest. In, in a separate paper, but I'm exceeding my time, I try to harness and other, uh, other legal doctrines, um, the duty from impartiality, but I will, I will be the first to, to admit that it's a weak doctrine, okay? It's a, weak, it's a doctrine that essentially calls on directors to have regard, think very, very honestly uh, about the company, and that's about it. You can't go to court with that. Thank you, Amir. That's a great closure for the session. Uh, did you? No, 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 there is. I'm sorry, there is no time. And apologies to those who were waiting uh, uh, to ask a question. I'm sure they can directly get in touch with, with Amir. Let me convey some personal sadness for not having been able to see you here physically, but at least, you know, happy to see Same you. here, same here, same here. Uh, so we'll move now to Oslo, where Beate uh, Schofiel uh, is going to be our next uh, speaker. And please keep an eye on the chat because Eduardo is going to send you threatening messages when you exceed your time. Yes, if I exceed my time, <laughs> right? Um, yes, uh, thank you for for the uh, for the invitation. It's an honor to be here and uh, and a pleasure. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to have the chance uh, to to follow up on these uh, three excellent uh, presentations. Um, what I will uh, speak about, my starting point is that it's time to get real. It's time to talk about how to integrate sustainability into corporate governance, which from my many years of research also through multi-jurisdictional comparative projects means talking about the duties of the board. And of course, the proposed corporate sustainability due diligence directive makes this an especially topical discussion. So with a focus on, on the how to question, that means that I'm not going to talk about climate change as a code read for humanity. And I'm not going to talk about the other code reds for humanity. I'm not going to talk about the latest research from this year that shows that we have now exceeded the fifth of the hitherto identified nine planetary boundaries, putting even further stress on Earth systems on which we depend for this Earth to be a relatively space, safe space for humanity. Nor am I going to talk about how many of the global value chains of European businesses are based on destruction of the environment, exploitation of, of people, and undermining of the economic basis for functioning societies, threatening the overarching goal of sustainability understood as securing social foundations for humanity now and for the future, while mitigating pressures on planetary boundaries, a safe and just space for humanity. Instead, I'm going to talk about how we can integrate sustainability into corporate governance, because we all know that business has such an important role to play here. And to do that, I'm moving to company law, because we need to go to company law. Company law is the regulatory infrastructure for decision-making in business. And as all company law scholars who have analyzed the sources know, company law gives a broad discretion to corporate boards and by extension, senior management in their corporate governance to move the businesses over onto a more sustainable path. This space is, however, taken up by the social norm of shareholder primacy. And I use the expression, the social norm of shareholder primacy as uh, distinguished uh, against the legal norm of shareholder value. So in our work, we've used the shareholder value as the legal norm that we see, for example, in the UK, which is at one end of the spectrum when we've analyzed uh, the interests of the company uh, across jurisdictions and over to the other end of the spectrum, the more pluralistic uh, jurisdictions as we have in, for example, in Norway and, and the Netherlands. But shareholder primacy has taken over the space, whatever the interests of the company are as a matter of, of core company law. And that is why we say, and I will say to you today, that we think that company law needs to take back that space and integrate sustainability into corporate governance through integrating it clearly 
and in a principle-based way into the duties of the board. And let's look at what the directive is doing, first of all, then. The directive, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, the proposal, I mean, um, uses corporate sustainability in the same way as the proposal for the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive does, which is uh, uh, meant to, to then change the status that we've had for quite a few years now with the so-called non-financial reporting directive. So this is really good as a starting point when we want to uh, be serious about sustainability and company law and corporate governance. But what do they actually mean in this directive with corporate sustainability? Well, if we look at the whole text, the explanatory text, the preamble and the proposed provisions, including the title, there are about 50 mentions of sustainability. Uh, but there is no definition at any point of sustainability or corporate sustainability. But we see expressed in uh, the rules uh, of the proposed directive that it's limited to human rights and environmental impacts, which is not enough. Uh, to define sustainability. And then it's further limited by saying that uh, adverse environmental impact uh, means a violation of a provision in international environmental conventions and then the same with human rights. So there's a proposal for an EU directive that limits itself to international law, an EU directive that doesn't engage with all of the EU law, all of the member state law that is aiming to protect the environment and protect people and ensure anti-corruption and fair taxation issues, which are not mentioned in this corporate sustainability directive at all. So let's see what they're doing when it comes to company law then. Well, the directive does, uh, in spite of uh, what we understand has been two really tough rounds with a regulatory scrutiny board in the commission. And we now also understand that uh, the regulatory scrutiny board should be scrutinized, but that's a discussion for, for another presentation. Um, but in spite of, of, of having to, to uh, go back twice to revise the proposal, they've kept some company law in uh, the proposal. Uh, so article 25.1 uh, of the proposed uh, directive clarifies that the duty uh, is to, pr to promote the interests of the company, which is a core company law recognition, which all of us who have actually gone into the sources of company law know. Uh, and I emphasize this because it is so often lost in the discussion, which is why it's also important that the, uh, that the uh, proposal uh, does it. Although it does it then by referring generally to directors, this Anglo-Saxon term, instead of speaking about uh, the board. Uh, and then it goes on to, which we've already heard from previous presentations, this take into account. While promoting the interests of the company, the directors should take into account, and then comes various good things. And this is the Anglo-American enlightened shareholder value, which, as we've already heard earlier today, is no reason to think that that is a good way forward. So what should we do instead? What should we do instead than limiting uh, sustainability uh, in the way that the directive uh, does and with a good starting point going off into the Anglo-American enlightened approach? Well, what we propose uh, based on the research uh, that we, we did in the EU funded uh, SMART project uh, is that we should take sustainable value creation as a starting point. Sustainable value creation is an emerging uh, concept in uh, corporate governance. Value creation is what most business people with respect for themselves and their, their work would say, that's what we do. Uh, if they really were to express what they, what they think that they are doing in their jobs, it's not about maximizing returns for shareholders, although they might think that is the duty imposed on them by law because uh, the social norm of shareholder primacy has become so strong that it has become a legal myth. But at the heart of any good business person, I posit, is value creation. That's what it's about. And in the light of uh, the, the emerging recognition of the risks of unsustainability and the recognition of the extreme unsustainabilities of business as usual, sustainable value creation has become an emerging concept. We see this reflected in reforms of corporate governance codes, 
in Europe over the last years with examples including Austria, Germany, Belgium, uh, Denmark and uh, the Netherlands uh, to je take just a few examples. If we take sustainable value creation seriously, uh, I would suggest that it should be formulated as sustainable value creation that works to mitigate the pressures on planetary boundaries. For those of you who are familiar with my work, you would know that I have until today when presenting said sustainable value creation within planetary boundaries. But uh, in the latest discussion with my uh, environmental scientist uh, colleagues, we have agreed that it's actually too late to talk about staying within planetary boundaries because they are so extremely exceeded. We are not going to, as my, my good colleague Sarah Cornell has said, unextinctify uh, uh, animals, for example. Uh, so the best we can do now is to work to mitigate the pressures on planetary boundaries to keep this Earth as, as, as safe space as possible. And of course, adapt to the changes that are happening. So sustainable value creation that works to mitigate the pressures on planetary boundaries. And sustainable value creation is a principle-based concept, something that we recognize very well in continental European law, at least, as something that can be put into a uh, legislative uh, provision and then gradually can be firmed up and changed through development of uh, best practice and so on. So with that starting point, how do we then integrate sustainable value creation into corporate governance? Well, the first step uh, is to avoid the shareholder versus uh, stakeholder dichotomy. And I very much understand that uh, uh, my Anglo-Saxon uh, colleagues will use the shareholder versus uh, stakeholder uh, language, although I don't think it's a good idea for reasons that I uh, will explain. But from a continental European perspective, which after all is most of, uh, of Europe, most of the European Union, uh, that really isn't a, a good a starting point because the, the uh, sh shareholder versus stakeholder dichotomy, going into that debate, it means firstly that we're not taking uh, company law seriously uh, and uh, that we are opening up for a discussion which we've seen through the EU's Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative, we're opening up for discussion that puts people in two different camps. And this idea that uh, the only alternative to shareholder primacy is some kind of vague stakeholder theory is a very good deflection device for the important debate that we need to have how to reform company law to actually ensure sustainable value creation. It is also, as a third point, the biggest mistake that the European Commission has made in its sustainable corporate governance initiative. So that's the first step. The second step is to recognize the concept of interest of the company and company law and to not attempt to harmonize it. Uh, this is also a mistake that the Commission made by opening up in its uh, initial uh, consultation that they were considering this, considering um, harmonizing the interests of the company with some references uh, to, to stakeholders and, uh, and thereby uh, opening up for this very detrimental emotional and ideological debate that we have seen. The interests of the company should continue to, to, to stay as a national company law concept that can be developed in national company law. And thirdly, we should integrate the concept of sustainable value creation in a research-based manner and a principle-based manner. And with principle-based, I mean as much space for the individual creative, innovative value creation within a company while giving firm enough, a firm enough framework to ensure that uh, the value creation happens in a sustainable manner. And doing that would mean based on, on the reform proposals that we've uh, developed in over a decade of research, preferably to, to a redefined purpose of the uh, undertaking, sustainable value creation that mitigates pressures on planetary boundaries. I know that it's uh, totally unrealistic that will come into an European directive anytime soon, and it doesn't have to be because we can jump directly to the important part which is operationalizing such an overarching purpose through redefined duties of, uh, of the board. 
And we have suggested that this should be set out, that the duty of the board is to promote the interest of the company in such a way as to create sustainable value that mitigates pressures on planetary boundaries, with the last part being changed, as you uh, just heard me explain. So that makes the interest of the company in the nationally defined way the core, and then we have a framework of sustainable value creation. This then should be set out clearly that this is to be integrated in business models, strategies, and risk management with sustainability due diligence as a key tool, which of course makes the current proposed directive very interesting. We also suggest that based on sustainability due diligence, that should be the duty of the board to ensure that it is uh, carried out, the board should set out an ambitious plan for continuous improvement. And I'm very happy to explain more what I mean with that uh, in the discussion or refer you to publications where we have written about this. To finally take people and the environment as seriously as we for many years, many decades have been taking financial issues we also need an assurance of the process of due diligence by external experts, auditing of sustainability reporting, and public and private enforcement. The OECD due diligence guidance of 2018 is amongst the best that we have out there. And the directive proposal, when it is developed further in the legislative process, should engage better with that. And it should engage with the research-based concept of value creation. Taking that seriously means as a starting point to talking about what do we actually want to achieve. And here I forgot to change from within planetary boundaries, but you get my point. These need to be defined in the law. And then we can define the sustainability aspects, drawing on three sources and not just the international laws. And this could be mandated to affect change towards sustainable uh, corporate uh, governance by setting it out as a duty for the company and for the board, encompassing the business of the company and having an integrated sustainability approach. It needs to be mandatory law, enough of the voluntary processes. We've tried that for too many years and no safe harbor, no box ticking as Claire Smith and, uh, uh, sorry, Claire Bright and, Lee, and Lisa Smith have, have tried out, but it, it will be crucial for legal certainty and for a level playing field for business. With that, I leave you with the argument that uh, it's time to click into place the missing piece of company law. I'll be happy to share this uh, with the organizers so they can share it with the participants if you want to, to read more about our work and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much and apologies for going about 45 seconds over time. Thank you for going on in 45 seconds of our time. Uh, let me open the floor for questions. Oh, do you wanna, okay, let's start from online then. Right. Uh, yeah, oh, you yeah, wanna, yeah. oh yeah, 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 we can uh, put them up. So, uh, Colin, you wanna start? Well, I think Amir was first, so why doesn't Amir go first? I was first, okay. Oh, thank you. Um, I think this is fascinating. Um, this is fascinating because it really touches the very uh, uh, kind of challenge that all com us as company lawyers, at least those among us who are company lawyers, uh, 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 face. And um, without really, without trying to ridicule anything that you said, yet, that, um, I would ask you, uh, who will sue? So if, if there's an injunction uh, to mitigate pressures on planetary boundaries, one is bound to, to, to wonder who will sue. Should there be a commissioner of planetary boundaries? Uh, should there be private enforcement? And I think you see the point. Um, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that question. As you know yourself, there's always too little time in a 15 minute presentation to share everything. And it would have been also if I had spoken for three hours. So that's uh, that's a very good point. And thank you for going to the heart of the most important or difficult question in this. And that is the planetary boundaries one. And I can say straight off that there is no way today of defining what every company must do uh, in with its globalized business to uh, mitigate the pressures on planetary boundaries. This is something that will have to uh, remain a, um, 
um, a, a principle-based uh, regulation. And what we have uh, suggested is uh, in the in the specific formulation that the that it should be that the board shall work to ensure that the operations and activities of the company including the full life of its products, processes, and services, contribute to global society mitigating the pressures on planetary boundaries, because it's not something that one company can do uh, by itself. Uh, it's a bit easier with the sustainable value creation part, which I can, can get back to. The most important uh, way that we suggest that this should be enforced is, uh, is connected to the sustainability due diligence the duty to undertake a sustainability due, due diligence, to have that assured by external experts, and to follow that up through an ambitious improvement plan. Uh, we do agree with the European Commission that there should be public enforcement. We, I, I do not uh, think at all that there should be some kind of uh, planetary authority for protecting uh, planetary boundaries. Uh, but, but it is possible uh, to, to follow this up in a much more realistic and pragmatic way. When it comes to the question of who will sue, which goes to the, the private uh, enforcement part, I believe, um, that, that is a very good point. And I think one of the most important uh, aspects here of getting into place a good legislative reform in this area is that we can get into more controlled uh, forms, the international trend of lawsuits that is already ongoing. So the question of who will sue is partly answered by look at all who are suing already. So the, these, uh, um, these, these firmly set uh, company law and, and uh, contractual law, contract law uh, starting points that a parent company is not responsible for its subsidiary and that uh, its uh, leading company is not responsible for what happens down in the global value chains, that is already being challenged through the international trend of lawsuits. So what we also suggest in our reform proposals is that there should be better procedural rules in place to make clear who can actually sue, because now we have this a situation of extreme legal uncertainty, both for the decision makers in companies and for those affected by, by, by the business of the companies. And again, we suggest that the, the main enforcement should happen through following up the sustainability due diligence. And we think that if a company has undertaken a sustainability due diligence properly, then that will act as a very good defense in a court of law. So this will then be a self-reinforcing process considering that people are suing all the time already. Thank you. Next question is from Colin Meyer. Uh, thank you. I think this was a, a great uh, presentation and it's certainly very much in line with what I was saying as well. Um, could you say to what extent you think that it's feasible to go along this route in the absence of it becoming universally adopted? That is to say, to what extent is it feasible for corporate sectors to compete in a world in which there is a coexistence of different systems, some of which implement this and some of which don't. Um, a second question, which uh, relates to uh, the previous question, is whether um, the determination of what is deemed to be sustainable is at the discretion of the board to determine or do you envisage that this would be in essence established as part of uh, an external regulatory process thank you for for those very good uh, questions colin and i totally agree that uh, that our presentations uh, uh, resonate with each other to 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 quite considerable considerable extent um so the the uh, the problem with the, with the international internationalization of financial markets and of business, uh, while uh, legislators are uh, are still on national levels or, in the best case, on regional levels such as the EU, is a very important one and one that that many uh, also we have uh, have struggled with. But we do believe uh, that the EU is such an important global actor and that uh, that the European Union is such 
the European economic area rather is such an important market that if good rules are put into place here, that this will have a knock-on effect in several ways, um, both through the, the follow-up by European businesses of the global value chains and uh, probably through attracting then also uh, the, the rising number of uh, international investors that actually wish to move towards more sustainability-oriented uh, businesses. When it comes to, nevertheless, to the competition problem, this is something that we have taken very seriously in our work and, uh, and I believe that the European Commission is, is uh, concerned with this as well and that there should be uh, some kind of uh, border protection measures um, to ensure that uh, European businesses are not outcompeted by, for example, US or Chinese businesses that, uh, that totally ignore these rules. And here we have to see uh, the uh, corporate governance uh, initiatives in context with what is happening in, in the product regulation, for example, with the circular economy initiative and the sustainable product policy there. So this is a large and connected, interconnected uh, question, and I'll be very happy to discuss this with you uh, more uh, later as well. Uh, but just these quick answers now. And then when it comes to who should define what is sustainable, that will always be something uh, that will have to be developed gradually. We have suggested, I had to go very quickly over those slides, but we have su suggested that it should be put into legislation um, on a prin in a principle-based way, what is meant with planetary boundaries and what is meant with sustainable value. Because there's so much sustainability washing and sustainability wishing out there that that really needs to be uh, set out clearly. And then again, we think that the operationalization of this should be through the sustainability due diligence rules, that this is really the key for ensuring that businesses integrate sustainability properly into their corporate governance. And here we also think that the rules should, in a similar way, uh, but in a better way, and has been done with the non-financial reporting directive so far, that it should be complemented with guidance uh, from the European uh, Commission, which should be revised say, every three years together with a, 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 a broad group bringing together uh, both uh, uh, scholars with, with relevant background and uh, uh, NGOs and businesses and uh, people from affected communities to ensure that best practice and the best available knowledge in sustainability science and sustainability research always uh, is a part of, uh, of this picture. But we don't see this as a silver bullet or as a quick fix, but we see this as a way of integrating into corporate governance, into the duties of the board, the overarching objectives of our societies today in a way that can then connect corporate governance with other areas of law. Because we know now that other areas of law, whether it's human rights law, environmental law, or labor law, tax law, all of these, they are not, they are not able to realize their potential today because at the heart of corporate governance is the shareholder primacy norm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is time for one 30 second question with a 30 second answer. Uh, yes. Noted. <laughs> um, just a quick clarifying question. I was wondering what you meant exactly by um, when you said that you would not like to see the interests of the company as a definition further harmonized. Um, yes. Uh, so thank you. The interest of the company is a uh, is, a, is right at the core of company law. And company law is still very much a national matter, although we have some harmonized rules. Um, we should allow for different cultures to develop. And I don't think it's a good idea that the EU should try to harmonize this concept and make it the same all over Europe for several reasons, both to, to respect uh, the, very, the variety of, of cultures and respect the subsidiarity principle, and pragmatically, because it's never, ever going to go through. So we should rather put sustainable value creation uh, as, as a framework around the interest of the company. But lifting up the interest of the company is important because there are so many people out there that don't seem to realize that that is the duty of the board because they think that the duty of the board is to maximize returns for shareholders. Thank you. I hope that was 30 seconds.
Thank you very much. That was a great session. Thanks uh, to the speakers and to the audience for the questions. And uh, I'm happy to announce that we didn't exceed the boundaries we were given us uh, <laughs> great. for this session. Thank you very much.